feet, including garage, excluding basement, in the RDA 20 zoning district. All buildings via new construction or by expansion in which floor area is equal to or greater than 5,000 square feet, including garage, excluding basement, in the RDB 10 zoning district. All buildings via new construction or by expansion in which the floor area is equal to or greater than 3,600 square feet, including garage, excluding basement, in the RG 6.5 zoning district. And this is the amendment 6.1. If an expansion is 500 square feet or less but still reaches one of the triggers, in four to six above, the Zoning Board of Appeals may waive the site plan review at a public meeting. Seven, change the slope over 6% of the existing grade of an area of more than 500 square feet. This is an article to amend the zoning bylaws, and accordingly it will require a two-thirds vote. The motion is brought by the Planning Board. On behalf of the Planning Board, the Town Planner, Brian Zakelli. Mr. Zakelli. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, good evening, Town Meeting. I'm here to talk about Article 2, just like the moderator said. So why are we here? Uh, generally, this has been a neighborhood concern. Uh, homeowners want to protect their property, promote responsible development around them, and ensure that character-defining neighborhood elements are respected when it comes to new development. Though of note, in general, the larger houses potentially have larger impacts towards stormwater flow, uh, the streetscape, or the look and feel of the street, uh, public safety, so this has to do with sight lines, emergency vehicle access. Uh, and large house review is uh, commonplace in uh, similar strong real estate markets in Massachusetts. Though a lot of the draw of the real estate market is obviously schools and proximity to Boston. Uh, but the natural setting and quaint character of Winchester from town center all the way out to the neighborhoods um, helps to drive the desirability of real estate. So we have a beautiful housing stock. Uh, that continues to attract uh, new residents. Uh, Tree-lined streets, as well as as well as well-proportioned houses, are, are certainly part of that equation. Looking uh, looking at all communities that have a higher real estate average than Winchester, um, all except uh, Concord and Newton have some type of site plan or design review for large houses. Concord and Newton don't have that because they actually have more strict. Uh, districts, they have local historic districts or other types of design review districts. Um, so, uh, those districts offer residents an appropriate uh, review for new construction that is actually quite more stringent than what we're trying to propose. Uh, this is not to say that because these towns have it, we should too. Uh, it's really just to point out that communities with a rich natural and historic setting are using zoning tools to help protect those resources and their real estate uh, markets continue to be strong. Extreme example, uh, Winchester has generous zoning uh, with regards to building coverage and height. Uh, but also, none of the pictures I'm showing today are, are in Winchester, that's kind of the point. Um, not that we, I mean, maybe we would see something like this, I kind of doubt it. But uh, in the past five years, we have seen an uptick in new construction with many residents in all districts asking for some type of tool to either review potentially impactful properties or somehow change the table of dimensional requirements to lessen the amount of house that can be built by right. So this is a little bit hard to read, but the table of dimensional requirements uh, essentially are the numbers that allow you to build a certain amount of feet from your neighbor, how tall you can go, uh, how much of your lot can you cover, uh, can you cover. Uh, mainly, we are looking at the RDA, which is the 20,000 square foot zone, so that's the largest zone for resident for single and, uh, for single family. Uh, the RDB, which is 10,000 square feet, which is also just single family, and then the RG, which is 6,500 square feet, single and two family. Uh, so, changing the table of dimensional requirements uh, to allow for smaller structures by right did not really sit well with a lot of people. Uh, in town, and therefore a review process was pursued. So current site plan review, what actually is in the code right now. So right now, site plan review exists for the IL district parcels that abut residential parcels. So the IL is the light industrial district. This is um, uh, industrial uses. So the idea is there can be some friction between residential uses and light industrial uses. So there should be some oversight of that. Next is that in the GBD district, parcels over 15,000 square feet, so this is in the general business district, uh, 
large parcels. The idea is that large parcels should be reviewed. Then any parcel in any district, this is the only time where there's site plan review potentially all over town where 25 parking spaces are required. So you're looking at a large commercial building, a big restaurant, or anything, or a, a, probably at the minimum something like a 12 unit multi-housing uh, complex, something like that. Uh, and then uh, last year we passed the CBD uh, rezoning which, uh, which allowed for any change of use um, or, or an increase in the floor space to have site plan review. So we want to expand on this. So the site, uh, site plan review is a process uh, that's by the ZBA and the planning board to promote predictable, safe development patterns. Uh, patterns. Uh, under site plan review, a project cannot be denied and it does not make the property non-conforming. That would be a special permit under 3.5.5. So this just has to, so site plan review, it, it, I make it very clear that the, the, the zoning board, um, in most cases, cannot deny. I say most cases because they take one, two, and three up here, and number four the planning board does. But uh, it does not make the property non-conforming. So here the, uh, it's a little bit hard to read for the colors, but maybe not too bad. Um, so I've just circled uh, the main areas where site plan review occurs. So it's hard to kind of turn and also talk, but uh, the uh, GBD uh, um, and the other general business districts are basically right um, up uh, Main Street. And then this tan is the light industrial and the blue is the RG. So this is where uh, there could be potential uses that are incongruent with each other where you have light industrial uses and residential uses. So what is the procedure? Like I said um, earlier, the CBD only, has, um, only conducts site plan review in the center business district and nowhere else. Uh, if it's not in the CBD, it is the Zoning Board of Appeals. No building permit can be issued until a site plan has been endorsed by the Zoning Board um, or the Planning Board in the, in the case of the CBD. What happens is that the, the Zoning Board places reasonable conditions on the building permit for developments with potential impact. This is, uh, the term reasonable conditions is from Massachusetts general law. Uh, the question of what, uh, a very easy question that everyone asks is, well, what, what are considered reasonable conditions? Uh, this is essentially for the, the zoning board, the applicant, and potentially the courts to determine. But, um, if you think that uh, the zoning board would put, or if, if the zoning board puts conditions on your permit that you think are unreasonable, then you would appeal that through the court system. So what are these regional condi reasonable conditions related to? So there are uh, reasonable conditions uh, for site plan review relate to pedestrian emergency vehicle, vehicle, vehicular and traffic safety, uh, as well as landscaping, building scale and architectural character, stone walls, trees, screening, utility, and the location of a number of other things. One of the things uh, in particular that site plan review looks at is neighborhood impact. So neighborhood impact is, is already in the code. Uh, the idea is with projects of significant impact or anything that would be initiated by a site plan review, you want to minimize the unreasonable departure from the character, materials, and scale of the buildings in the vicinity as viewed from public ways and places. So this currently the zoning board is doing right now. So new prompts. Uh, so it would be new construction, so a new house that would be 6,000 square feet, um, for instance in the RDA 20, or by addition, so you are at 5,000 square feet and you're putting a 2,000 square foot addition on. Um, and as you go down, the, 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 the initiation for site plan review uh, minimizes well. So if we're not really um, been con uh, looking at small additions, so the idea is if you reach, let's say you're in the RDA 20 and you have um, 5,500 square feet or 5,600 square feet and you're going to put a small addition on 500 square feet or less, either a mudroom or a master bath on the first, a uh, master bed on the first, first floor, the idea is that the zoning board would be able, would be allowed to waive that site plan review. So the idea is that small additions are not really what the target here. Uh, the target is generally is the new, the new construction that's um, very much out of scale with the rest of the street. Um, the square footage here, these numbers do include the the garage, but it does not include the basement. And projects cannot be denied; it only initiates a review. 
So this is just a couple examples, again, not uh, pictures in Winchester, but in the RG, the smallest zone, so some of the homes could be, four th uh, some of the square footage of the uh, lots could be three, three to 4,000 square feet. So this would be, um, this is a home that, Um, 3,800 square feet on a 6,800 square foot lot. You can't see all of the lot, but you can see the houses that are pretty close to it. Um, this is a um, relatively small lot, and it's a relatively large house. Um, again, so this is a 5,000 square foot home on a 10,000 square foot lot. These are the types of projects that would be initiated by review. And again, in the RDA 20, something like this, this is a 6,000 square foot home. Can't really see the 20,000 square foot lot, but it's exactly a 20,000 square foot lot. The last prompt um, is a change in slope. Uh, so your, the, if your property is pitched on a slope, um, slope is the rise over run. So uh, rise of, let's, for example, 3.44 feet over a run of 120, uh, the, your percent slope is right around 3%. The idea is if you're going to change that slope by 6%, meaning that if you're currently at 3% and you go to 9%, or if you're currently at 3% and you go the other way to a negative 3%, so it's a change in the slope of 6% of an area of more than 500 square feet. Uh, the reason why that this, we even talk about this. Uh, Mr. Zakella, your time has uh, expired. Would you care for more time? Um, yes, not even five minutes. It's moved and seconded that the speaker's time be extended for three minutes. All those in favor? Any opposed? Please continue. Um, so transformation of existing grades affect neighboring properties. There are clearly other issues at play in this slide uh, related to the scale of the building, the design, but this is here to mainly show that the grain changes which allow for a structure to tower over its neighbors is unnecessary. Uh, tower of neighbor through grade changes is unnecessary. So excessive amounts of retaining walls and stormwater runoff um, are certainly issues associated with grade changing. So uh, additional review of the change of natural topography is warranted. You can see that it's basically on a pedestal compared to the other houses in the neighborhood, um, which it's still within the height zone that it would be allowed. But because it's graded in a way that uh, kind of has a menacing feel, it's, it's very much unnecessary and something like this should most likely be avoided. So again, uh, we've seen an increased uh, new construction over the past five years. You affect your neighbor's property. You do invest in your street, not just your house. We've had a growing feedback in the RG, the RDA, and the, R and the RDB, all related to scale of new housing Excessive tree removal has uh, certainly occurred, as well as water runoff issues. Uh, the proposal is to use an existing review process, we're not trying to change it, promote responsible development, and we are trying to institute a conservative approach in comparison to other communities. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Okay, we have a recommendation from the Board of Selectmen. So the Board of Selectmen recommend favorable action on Article 2. I uh, think this is very light zoning, um, and uh, I think that a lot of the acts to it. Uh, asked Brian earlier, how many impacted um, homes in the past year uh, would be subject to reg regulation like this? And, um, and uh, of the 22 uh, new builds, um, there would have been 10. Um, and this process is a let's step back and see what we're doing, um, work with developers, and um, make suggestions about how to move forward sensibly. Um, one of the great benefits for me running for office was, uh, besides standing at the transfer station in the middle of the winter, and um, uh, was going door to door and um, speaking to um, residents about issues that were important to them. Uh, the number one thing that people told me, told me was the scale of homes being built in their neighborhood. Uh, one woman on uh, uh, Middlesex Street um, said for 50 years she li li has lived in her home. And she wakes up every morning, has her coffee, walks out, um, looks out to Mount Pisgah and enjoys the view. Um, she has a modest home, 
uh, but it was important to her to have that continuity over the years. And she pointed behind me and uh, I turned around and there's um, end to end a lot, a new two family home. And she said, I can't see that um, mountain anymore. And I've been here for a long time. It's important to me. Um, so um, what I think is important about uh, the growth that we've experienced in Winchester over the past decade or more, um, and we've seen it in schools, in street traffic is, you know, another one that we've uh, we've been dealing with, uh, but this number one uh, issue of, uh, of growth and the, the change in the scale and the massing of some of the homes that's being built um, is uh, it, it's come from residents. This is a, a war article. It's driven by residents. Uh, it involved a long process with uh, <clears throat> developers, builders, um, and um, community members. Uh, realtors were involved in this conversation too. And while um, not everyone has supported it, this was the lightest um, zoning uh, tool that we could use to uh, really uh, uh, protect some of these homes. Um, and you're looking at a very short review time, three months, um, and as I said, only 10 uh, homes would have been affected. But uh, year over year, that makes a big impact on the integrity of the neighborhood and the identity of the neighborhood, and, uh, and people have concerns. Um, and I think working with developers, um, we can make some difference, differences by tweaking uh, certain structures uh, to uh, make it beneficial and reduce the massing. And I think that uh, uh, it's very uh, beneficial to the community. I recommend favorable action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bittencourt. Mr. Powers, if I suspect the minority position. Power is also a member of the board of selectmen. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, we did have a meeting earlier tonight, and Brian gave us a good summary. And what would have happened? There were 20 houses involved. Ten of them were delayed and would be subject to a bylaw. I think it's against property rights. This is, you know, we're a town meeting, but a lot of these votes, I think, should start taking place with the public and let them have a vote because I think it would be a far different vote than what we see. But I think you should take into consideration the delay. You've got people that would be delayed up to six months to do something with their property. They want to modify their property. You're inviting the neighbors to come in and challenge what they want to do with their money to modify. Are you Thank you, Mr. Powers. But we have a recommendation from the... Me, Mr. Larico, we were 3-2, which uh, should have been. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Um, but we have a recommendation from the Winchester Historical Commission. It's chairperson, Heather Von Baron. Ms. Von Baron. Moderator. Uh, the Planning Board is responsible in creating a framework after the demolition of our historical resources and just demolition also. The ZP is responsible for implementing the measures thereafter. Article number two promotes respectful development that falls in line with the neighborhoods and from our perspective, the historical neighborhoods as well. As we revitalize and restore existing homes, the room for growth should be encouraged to acknowledge the environment the buildings are placed inside. In addition, when properties of this massing and scale are placed into the historical neighborhoods in the zoning districts, it is critical that architects, site surveys, and landscapers are engaged so that we end up with a contributing new construction. The Historical Commission voted unanimously in support and recommend favorable action of town meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Von Mering. Uh, before we go further on the question, this requires a two-thirds vote, and so it will be necessary to appoint Hellers for purposes of this town meeting. Uh, Mr. Johnson, um, uh, Mr. Sekaris, Ms. Manzo, and Ms. Boney, if I could ask you to please stand if you could agree to act as tellers and ask you to raise your hand and affirm that you will provide a true and complete count of those members voting at the town meeting. Thank you very much. Um, for purposes of the middle section, um, Ms. Manzo, Mr. Sekaris, uh, Ms. Latz will be the on the left side, uh, and Ms. Dolan will be on the right side, your side, uh, Mr. Sekaris. Um, 
Ms. Boney, if you could count the Finance Committee, and Mr. Johnson, if you could count the uh, Board of Selectmen. Uh, tellers having been appointed, uh, further on the question, Mr. Conti. Can we get that mic turned on? All Is right. this lighting you requested, Tony? Yeah. <laughs> Mate, can we bring the lights back up? We wanted the mic there, not the lights off. It's the first night. A little shakedown cruise. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tony. All right. Thank you. Thanks, moderator. Um, I'd like to point out that the uh, town planner told us that the uh, planning board would not have the authority uh, to, to stop a project, only to impose reasonable conditions. But what are those reasonable conditions? What might they be? You know, frankly, does the, uh, uh, the criteria that he suggested sounded to me that uh, like they're subject to a lot of very subjective opinions. And it really uh, is going to turn something, what site plan review in, in our town has always been really only used in cases of large uh, projects which would have substantial impacts. However, in my pre I'm in Precinct 2, where much of the RG uh, uh, zone is located, uh, where a 3,600 square foot uh, property would then become subject to site plan review. Now, th what that means is if you have a 3,000 square foot house, which is not at all unusual, and you want to put 700, an addition of 700 square feet on it, you'd now become subject to site plan review, which would require uh, uh, appearance before the uh, uh, planning board in a public hearing, uh, which would add, but was, I'm sorry, it's not important. Thank you for the correction. Um, oh, so a relatively minor project is now going to be subject to something that was once reserved for major projects. Um, I frankly don't see the need for this. Uh, it's, it's really going to, it's going to represent a burden upon property owners, additional expense, delay, time, effort. Lots, I'm an attorney. It'll, it'll be, it's a, it's a full employment project for attorneys. Uh, so maybe I shouldn't be uh, objecting to that, but, uh, you know, it's going to add to the cost of when people want to make relatively minor project changes. And frankly, it gives the opportunity for every neighborhood gadfly to get their two cents in on uh, a relatively minor project. For that reason, I ask that uh, we vote no on this. Thank you. Further on the question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, if it's on, you may speak there. Great. Thank you. My name is Colleen McGinnis. I am an architect and a town meeting member for Precinct 1. I'd like to express my support for Article 2. Uh, Winchester residents currently have little to no control over the impact that a new home or large addition can have on their neighborhood. New homes in Winchester are nearly always built by a developer, not a homeowner. Winchester has become a target for developers because it does not have measures in place that are similar to neighboring towns. Through a site plan review process, which would include the opportunity for neighborhood feedback, this zoning amendment would ensure that new homes and large additions will be a responsible complementary change to a neighborhood. This amendment is not intended to limit house size or mandate a particular design type. Often small design changes that incur little to no added cost can make a home more consistent with the scale and character of a neighborhood. Some examples are using roof shapes that are similar in scale and form to adjacent homes, using siding, stone, or other exterior materials that are consistent with neighboring homes. The passage of this article, residents who sell their home to a developer can have some peace of mind, knowing that the new home that replaces theirs will not be detrimental to their former neighborhood. Since the new home that replaces theirs can still be just as large, the sale price of their property should not be negatively impacted. Developers will still want your property, but your former neighbors are much less likely to end up disappointed and angry at the change to their neighborhood. When a new home complements rather than detracts from its neighborhood, it improves the property value of the entire neighborhood. 
Therefore, I feel strongly that the passage of this article will benefit all residents. Thank you very much, Ms. McGinnis. <laughs> Further on the question, yes, Ms. Epps. Certainly, Ms. Savage asked Mr. Zakelli what the landscaping portion of the uh, Article 2 would entail. Uh, generally, it has to do with a lot of the removal of large trees, or it could be um, a buffer zone where there, there was maybe a lot of landscaping there, um, but then due to a, either an expansion or a new construction that a large buffer zone has been so the idea would be to possibly maintain as much of it as reasonably possible in terms of what the zoning board would, would do in any one case. What they would probably say is that every case is different. I know that's a horrible answer, but if you do ask them generally, you know, how are you gonna how are you gonna vote on this or how are you gonna vote on that, it's everything is context based. So it's a pretty difficult question and I'm sorry for the horrible answer. Thank you. Better? Okay. Judy Maritinell, Precinct 7. Um, I have a couple of concerns. Someone mentioned this could be a six month long process. Um, for a developer, maybe I'm not a developer, I don't know, maybe that's not a big deal. I think for a homeowner it might be, particularly if when they go through site review, um, they are told that they don't, site review says, no, we don't like this, and they have to go appeal with an attorney. Ka ching, ka ching. Um, I don't know how long that process with the attorney would be. Maybe Tony would know. Um, but anyway, I also wonder whether the um, planning board and zoning board have talked with the public to get some information. I have to agree, uh, when Steve Power says maybe this should be on a ballot for all the people who are building homes to make a decision on, that may be a good idea. We've had an uptick, we were told, in the number of homes that are being built particularly in this past year, and I think maybe all the homeowners would like to have some input and a chance to give what they feel should happen on this. Public meetings. Um, we had a series of public meetings uh, starting in January. So we had uh, five public meetings related to our spring town meeting articles. Um, I understand it's very difficult for many people to come to evening meetings. Um, that's why we thought five would be at least a good enough number. However, there's no way that we're going to be able to to you know get all the all of the you know, all of the public, all of the realtors. Um, but we did. I mean, we had lively debates on totally both sides. We had residents that were negatively affected by development. We had builders. We had realtors. They were, um, you know, it was a constant uh, back and forth. Some meetings were very well attended out of those five. Some were not well attended. You know, some way maybe we only had 10 or 12 people. Um, but we were able to get a lot of information out of it. The idea of, of opening it up to the, um, to the entire town is not completely unreasonable. That's generally why town meeting votes for zoning are two-thirds, because it's a pretty tall order. Thank you, Mr. Zichelli. Further on the question, Mr. Arrico. Kelly, just a few questions. The How would the uh, living area in the basement be handled? If there was a 
finished basements, if they had a uh, bedroom and bathroom in the basement, how would that be? Also, how would attic space be handled, whether it be finished, not finished? Many new homes have finished attics that can be used for family rooms or whatnot. Thank you, Mr. Rico. Mr. Zichelli, in response to Mr. Rico's questions. So we use the uh, existing definitions in the Winchester Zoning Code. So floor area does not include the basement. Um, and floor area does not include the attic if it is for storage. If the attic is for living area, then it would count. Um, uh, we, the one thing that we are saying differently, that the number that we're using, the 3,600, 5,000, 6,000, includes um, the floor area of the house and includes the garage, but not the basement. Um, there has been a clear, uh, couple people have been asking, well, what if the garage is in the basement? Um, meaning, uh, you know, part of the footprint. The idea is that we, we wouldn't count that. That doesn't make any sense. The idea is you want to kind of get the massing of the building and that's why the garage is included. Um, some other towns do uh, do use the garage uh, because it is part of the scale of the structure. Thank you, Mr. Zichelli. Mr. Rico with a follow-up. As a follow-up, whether you're for or against this article, it's my belief that there's some ambiguity with the terminology that's used in this article as it relates to when you look at definitions, and when you have an article, a zoning article, you have to look at each word individually and how it is specifically written in the zoning bylaws. And when I read this article, I see some amb ambiguity with the term, for example, floor area, which in this article <coughs> excludes, uh, includes the garage, but the floor area definition in the zoning bylaws excludes that. So whether you're for or against it, I, I think that this article needs to be to be amended, tweaked, whatever, because I think it'll cause uh, many issues and who's going to interpret this uh, with the ZBA, who's going to enforce it. Uh, I don't know if it's possible to get town council to, to maybe give an opinion on that as far as it relates to the ambiguity on a few some of these terms. Thank you, Mr. Rico. Uh, Town Council, uh, if you could uh, opine on the consistency of the use of the term floor area as it appears in the article and otherwise in the zoning bylaws. I actually believe that there is an ambiguity. Uh, I also believe that it was discussed at great length by the planning board. I'm not quite sure how they came down on it. Uh, I would say that the ambiguity uh, does not automatically make this a bad article. Uh, the ambiguity will be resolved first at the Building Commission level, second at the Board of Zoning Appeals, and ultimately, um, if a party is aggrieved, whether it's an owner or a neighbor, at the, uh, under a, a judge, either in the land court or at the uh, area court or uh, and, and on and on. So uh, the fact that there are ambiguities, and I don't think this is the only one that I, I know, but that, that does not necessarily mean that, you know, this is not a valid article for this town meeting. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Further on the question? Yes, Mr. Sekaris. <laughs> so. Both an open-ended and a dangerous question, Mr. Sekaris, but we'll do our best. Mr. Welch, Mr. Sekaris asked for a follow-up there and some clarification on your uh, opinion that some ambiguity exists. As I understood Mr. Welch's previous response, it was that he did allow uh, that his belief would include some ambiguity, but perhaps that ambiguity is not something that's foreign to regulation or legislation, and that as such, it will be resolved by the parties responsible for the enactment of the act or as necessary on judicial review. Mr. Welch. Sure. Site plan review. What it means is that the, uh, because these are as of right, if what it means is that the uh, permit granting or reviewing authority, in this instance it's not, it's a reviewing authority, 
uh, which happens to be the Board of Zoning Appeals, can impose reasonable conditions. So if in fact, I think in, in the, by, the bylaw is proposed, or the definitions as proposed for this particular exercise differ in part from what's currently in the existing bylaw. But that does not mean that, you know, you can't apply a different definition for a different for, for a different review. So therefore, the fact that other parts of the bylaw use floor area differently doesn't necessarily mean that floor area as it's used in this particular uh, review process, it in fact is in, you know, a violation of law. That's all it means. I hope that clarifies. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Yes, sir. Uh, I Yang Zhang. I came from Prince Sector 8. Uh, talking about uh, the ambiguity, so the planning board uh, uh, presented uh, some development. Uh, let's. Uh, hey, can you it? speak in the mic microphone? Thanks. So, can the board uh, give us some example that uh, development? Uh, how, how can they be harmful to the neighborhood? Can they give us some example? Also, uh, in terms of ambiguity, so can the article involve uh, more details about uh, how the review process will be done? So is that uh, purely uh, closed door subjective or they have some formula to judge your development plan, see if it's okay or not okay like that? So thank you. So <clears throat> to you, Mr. Zakelli, the uh, town meeting member asks if uh, you could speak with some more particularity as to the review process itself uh, and the factors that might be uh, weighed and how the determination would be made. Yeah, I'm just going to bring up very quickly. Um, so let me get this larger so this makes sense. But. Um, Okay, so the decision by uh, the Board of Appeals is really based, I mean, there, there are 10 things that are used to, uh, to look at the project. Um, so you can, uh, we can go through every one if you, if you want, but generally it's um, just to highlight it, so minimize the volume of cut and fill, number of removed trees, provide stormwater management, maximize safety, provide adequate access, minimize obstruction of scenic views, minimize visual intrusion by controlling the visibility of parking, there from headlights, that's to do with the areas of where parking are located so they're not in an uh, uh, obtrusive way, uh, minimize unreasonable departure from the character materials and scale, we talked about that, contamination from groundwater from on-site wastewater disposal, and ensure compliance with the zoning bylaw. So it is in the books, we're not just changing any, anything in terms of the review procedure, which we're changing what initiates a review. Um, so you can see that there is certainly a lot of uh, respect given to the, to, the, to the review authority board, in this case, the Zoning Board of Appeals in almost all, dis, in almost all cases. It basically says that they can only grant a determination based upon taking into account these 10 things. Um, it's a, it is a public process. Um, it, is, uh, it is a public hearing, so not behind closed doors um, and open. Mr. Zakelli, if you could just clarify that 9.5.7 currently exists within the zoning code. That's correct. This is the current code um, that we've been doing site plan review under for many years. Thank you very much. Further on the question? Yes, sir. Mr. Zagelli, the question is whether or not the review having been made, the person who's having the review done on their property is required then to conform to the uh, review. So you, you go through your review, um, a certain number of conditions maybe get put on your per maybe get put on the building permit. Uh, then you would get a building permit issued to you 
with those conditions. If you choose not to follow it, that is a risk that uh, that you are taking. Will, this, will the zoning board and or building commissioner come after you like the boogeyman? No. Uh, but you would be something illegal. It's a, <clears throat> let's clarify that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> There's a, little, there's a little bit more millennial risk taking there than I might like, but the, uh, I think, so the, the answer to your question is that, that no, that yes, what's going on is that you're applying for a building permit. You are required, if the project that you're seeking a permit for implicates these factors, you would then be required to go for that site plan review. The reviewing authority, the Zoning Board of Appeals, would then place reasonable conditions on the permit itself. So you would not be authorized to continue with the construction unless it was in conformance with those reasonable conditions. So yes, you would be required to comply with the reasonable conditions or otherwise appeal the imposition of those conditions. Thank you very much. Further on the question. Yes, Mr. Richards. Uh, Jack Richard from uh, Precinct 1. Um, just to make a further clarification on that point, yes, you must comply, and if you do not comply for a long enough period, men with guns will show up on your property and make you comply. That's, that is inherent in every regulation we pass. You can either comply or else. So to keep that in, and that's, it's, it's not a comical point. It's a point to be made that when we, we should be careful about how we regulate our neighbors, because at the end of every one of these regulations is an or else. That is the force that's required to make you comply if you don't. So keep that in mind. I think that's important. Um, another thing, I, I, you, all, you may know where I stand on the whole balance between property rights and, and the neighborhood rights. I'm far to the extreme, I guess, for most of you on the property rights point. But on this particular case, I have personal experience. Um, I built a property in Rutland. Um, I tried to build it. I had, it needed site plan review. It is not true that you cannot be denied site plan review. I was denied site plan review. In fact, if, if Mr. Welch could tell you, the Prudential case says that if, if the conditions are so intractable as to not make themselves available for easy solution, a board can deny site plan review. So please, no one here should be under the illusion that site plan review means you will get, will get a permit. You may not. I had to go uh, after nine hearings and after then, I sued the town. I spent two years in land court. When I say I sued them, I personally sued them. I won the case, but it added a great deal of expense and put a great deal of uncertainty into um, that development. So that's, it's not true that you cannot be approved. Another thing I would ask Mr. Sakelli to do, just for clarification purposes, could you show the slide that had the slope graph on it, please, just for a second? Um, my memory, and it went by quickly, was that the horizontal axis was 120 feet and the vertical was 3 feet? They seem to be so far out of any proportion. Yeah, it's not... It's no, not can I, could I see it, please? Thank well, you. Yeah, the, so let's, let's just follow the protocol here. One, if there are questions to be posed, they'll be posed through the chair. Okay. And two, once the question is posed, I'll state the question. We'll allow Mr. Zakelli time to respond, and then you can follow up. Okay. as you would like, Mr. Richard. So, Mr. Zakelli, the question is whether you could display the uh, graph showing the uh, change in slope. So that's before us, and uh, Mr. Richard would follow up. Could I comment on the graph? That line looks to be about three feet. Now, 120 feet would, is roughly the, the length of this whole room. So that seems to make it look as only slopes at 6% will be affected in those slopes are nothing like this. That bottom line on that slope might be 6% for all we know. That's a very small, 6% is a minuscule slope over that distance. And that line makes it look as if it's a major slope. Minor point, but it gets to the point of these other houses that were shown in this um, presentation, which are not in Winchester. And I, I don't see, you know, how they have any bearing on, on what we have here. Um, and then just a, 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 an overall point. Essentially what happens here is these developers who have been made out to be boogeymen, they buy a property and I assume they put some work or value into it and try to sell it for more. And on average I would say it's probably fair to say they buy it in with this town for about 500 and they sell it for about a million. That's sort of typical. Um, I don't 
The speaker will continue. The, uh, the timing will be in order. I guess but the numbers aren't as important as my larger point. That is, when someone adds value to the property next to mine, I, I'm not sure how I understand that it takes away value from my property. I might not like it aesthetically, but markets have opinions too. And those things that draw better returns in the market, those houses that draw more prices, maybe not to my liking, maybe not to your liking, but to someone's liking, they are in fact an improvement. Otherwise, that property wouldn't go from its relatively lower value to its relatively greater value. So I think for us to decide that we don't like them based on our aesthetic sense is not, is not fair. Um, Yeah, I, I get the, another point that was sort of, I, I think it was glazed over, but I think it's terribly important. It gets to the essence of what we're talking about. If the dimensional requirements in town are insufficient in the general opinion of the folks in town, we should change those. But it was said that, well, there's not much support for that. We can't do that. So let's institute this roving process where these extremely vague conditions, which give roving discretion to the board to decide that it's not in character with the neighborhood or it's not quite what I would like to see there. That's not really a fair way to go about it. The essence of a fair law is that someone, before they act, can comport their behavior with the law because they know what it means. This is too vague. Um, and, and, and essentially, I think it's based on a little fear of change. Uh, Robert Kennedy said that uh, progress is a nice word, but change is its motivator and change has its enemies. The people that built this town before us changed it to here. I'm glad they did. We don't have a right to enforce our temporary, uh, subjective, and usually aesthetic views on the future. So if, if we want to make changes as a group as to how high a house should be, or how wide it should be, how much it should cover, let's do that. But let's not give a board roving discretion. And I would like maybe town council, if he could, to confirm my point that you can be denied site plan review. I, I absolutely know what happens. I could cite the case um, in that it changes this very much and it adds expense to these things. Uncertainty and expense are the, um, are the enemies of any sort of economic progress. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richard. Speaker's time has expired. There was a uh, question for town council to the point of whether uh, site plan review uh, can be denied. All the mass cases I have read on the subject say the same thing, that uh, regulate the use, site plan review, on an as of right uh, proposal, it regulates the use but does not prohibit it. Now, that doesn't mean that, you, that through litigation it might go several years, but it's still site plan review on as of right does not prohibit the use. It's a question for the courts, ultimately, would be whether the conditions imposed were reasonable or not. That's, that's mass law. So Mr. Zichelli is correct when he says categorically that site plan review under this bylaw does not prohibit the use. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Ms. Savage, further on the question. Three zoning districts that were changing um, cover the full, co cover all residences in town. Um, and can you explain one more time how you came up with these square footages for each um, districts? And what per percent of renovations in the last year would have been covered by these? You mentioned rebuilds, about half of rebuilds, but how many renovations? Um, I'll try to get all of them here. So looking at the town, are the colors, the colors are... Mm -hmm. um, RDA 20 is like 10. RDA 10 is most of Winchester. Site plan review already exists. Site plan review exists for large parcels in
That was question one. Sorry, what's question two? Question two, uh, Mr. Zichelli, was how the uh, particular square footages in the motion were arrived at. So um, a lot of those were arrived at. We, we saw a very large uptick in the amount of um, large uh, duplexes in the RG. Um, a lot of the ones we were seeing are well over even uh, 5,000 square feet. So 2,400 square feet for each, uh, for each house, right in a sea of single family homes that are on 4,000 square foot lots. So we wanted to capture a lot of the two families, um, flexes rather. Um, when, and then when it came to the RDB 10 and the RDB 20, we didn't really want to capture every single new construction. Um, we didn't. We thought that might have been a little onerous. So based upon, I mean, a, a new a new home in Winchester basically starts um, in terms of uh, uh, not on a small lot. So outside of the RG, you're looking at a right around 4,500 square feet, and then it goes up. So we were basing it on what you know, how many projects we would really or not we how many projects the zoning board would really be end up uh, end up reviewing when it came to new construction. Um, I do not have a number for the renovations. Um, this has generally not been a problem uh, in terms of resident feedback at all. It's been a very, very minor issue related to the, uh, the amount of additions that are happening. Um, we do see a lot of additions that are 500 square feet or less. Um, a very easy project that many uh, families do is some type of a mudroom um, that's under 500 square feet. Or a first, or turning a first floor, um, uh, a first floor home into uh, the first floor of a home um, into an aging in place, so that you can have everything on the first floor. So you'd have a, a master bedroom uh, with a bath. So everything else would generally be there except for the bedroom and the bath. Um, again, that was trying to say that um, we could, that, that the zoning board could waive the site plan review um, for 500 square feet or less. So we we are less concerned about the additions, and I can honestly say we, we do not have that analysis in terms of how many houses would have been um, initiated by the site plan review. Thank you, Mr. Zichelli. The, matter, the motion comes before the town meeting on Article 2. It requires a two-thirds vote. A vote in favor would be to adopt the changes that proposed by the planning board and articulated by Mr. Zichelli this evening. All those in favor, please rise and the tellers will count. All those opposed, please rise and the tellers will come. Hundred and fifty five members of the meeting having voted, a hundred and four required for passage, a hundred and fourteen having voted in the affirmative, Article two passes. This brings us to
Article 3, uh, it is uh, 10.08. Uh, um, we'll uh, go to 10.30 and see where we are. Um, it had been my hope uh, to uh, complete the non-financial articles tonight, but I don't want to keep the meeting too late. Um, we will uh, proceed on uh, Article 3. Um, under Article 3, uh, another motion by the Planning Board. It's moved and seconded to see if the town will vote to amend Section 10.0 of the Winchester Zoning Bylaw by adding new entries for green space and hardscape and including such in the Table of Dimensional Requirements in Section 4.0 of the Winchester Zoning Court. Code, new definition of green space to include grass, trees, shub, shrubs, vegetated or other softscape areas, pools, fish ponds, or other water features, including but not limited to fountains and specifically does not include areas for parking. New definition of 